And uh, if you want to have anything you'd like to add, please throw it in the chat or just use the little hand raise icon. Um, all right, so without further ado, I'll turn over to Jana Valakovic. She's uh, just an incredible resource. She is the forest advisor to the of the California Cooperative Extension for Humboldt and Down North Counties. Um, she's the co-lead of the Northern California region of the Fire Science Consortium and is on the Northern California Prescribed, Prescribed Fire Council in the steering committee. Um, her list of accolades is very long. She's an expert in fire ecology and fire science and just everything, everything fire and forest. And we thank her so much for being here. And I'll stop bumbling and I'll turn it over to Yana. <laughs> thank you, Yana. Thank you, Mitchell. And thank you for all the folks who helped organize this event tonight. I'm sorry, we're still in the virtual space, but it, it makes it easier perhaps to, to be together. And uh, I'm really enjoying all the in-person events these days. So I look forward to an opportunity when we can do that. So I appreciate the expediency that this, this creates and the opportunity this creates. So my name is Yana Valakovic. I work for the University of California in partnership with Humboldt County. I've done that uh, work for now 22 years. And uh, for those who don't know my history, I grew up in Southern Humboldt. So I'm, I'm one of you all. And um, I'm, a, I'm an ecologist, I'm a forest scientist. And as an extension agent, my job is really to, to try and learn new things and bring those resources back to our community and help try and solve local problems. So it's a real pleasure to be with you. Along the way, I've picked up uh, a whole set of skills and really about how buildings burn and how communities can best manage those issues and how to mitigate the challenges. And so I look forward tonight to share some of those thoughts and you know thinkings around how we think about Garberville, how we think about Southern Humboldt more broadly and sort of the, the challenges that are before us. And, and the challenges are not going away. They're only increasing. I think we've got a, a good sense that um, <clears throat> These are these challenges are really um, mounting in a way that you know few of us saw coming, and so I'm grateful to you all for pulling this event together and helping us think through kind of our collective issues and what we can do about this. I've got a number of slides, maybe 45, 50 slides. I'm happy to pivot in in many ways around this talk. I think I've got um, many of your questions um, already pre-prepped and answered. So yes, I'm gonna help you think about publications and where we might be able to go. What are the next resources? What's expensive and what's inexpensive? Um, how do we think about this um, from a town perspective versus a rural perspective? So you know, I look forward to try and dialogue with you all and think through these issues together and collectively. Um, we're in uncharted territory and, um, you know, the solutions are not all before us today. Um, and I look forward to, you know, your expertise in this space. So with that, what I have uh, prepared tonight is, you know, some thought about how we've evolved perspective to something we call fire mitigation or the ability to try and address some of the challenges before us. I'd like to talk about the types of fire exposures that a building or you all might experience and then contextualize that for uh, Southern Humboldt County and for Garberville. I'd like to share some of my uh, research, research respective to the um, campfire in, in Paradise, as well as my recent uh, travels to the Marshall Fire in Colorado that happened in December. And then I want to talk about how we're thinking about defensible space and home hardening, and then in with some thoughts about how we might prioritize actions and um, sort of explore some of the images that you all sent us and check for knowledge and, and try and think about how we evolve in this space. So I don't know how that sounds for you, but hopefully that meets um, some of your intentions. And I'm open to 
receive in, you know, feedback as we go. I have a little bit of a hard time seeing the chat as I present because it's in a different screen. Um, but maybe Mitchell, you can you can turn your camera or your voice on if for some reason um, I don't quite uh, see the things that are coming before me. I've got two screens, so I'm trying to manage that. And um, I look forward to being on this adventure with you all. I think the first step is really trying to understand about where we've come from and what we might do in that space. And you probably have heard a lot about this term defensible space. And this is some materials that were prepared uh, in the mid eighties. And it was really about creating defendable space. The idea of defensible space was creating a space where fire was about the forested environment and you could have a wildfire that could be coming towards the property towards the house and the goal is to mitigate the fuels mitigate the vegetation address the vegetation in a way that fire might come out of the canopy and come to the ground and therefore you could put an engine uh, probably a volunteer fire department member in in our context uh, to be able to safely defend your built environment, your home and your other structures. And that means that the flames would then be at a height that were manageable. So defensible space was really about how to manage those trees and that vegetation specifically to address that issue. But within that, we talk a lot about average fire conditions, extreme fire conditions, and you know what's a realistic expectation? And you know that's sort of a philosophical question, but I want you to think about that because there may be a chance that conditions are so severe that when we're in a condition to burn, so is the rest of the state. And so the question then becomes, where do we deploy resources at the state level? And what is the trigger? What is the sequence of events? You all may remember the Tubbs fire in 20, I think it's 2017 now. And you may know that we had a power line ignition that happened in Blue Lake uh, in the evening about five o'clock, something in that time frame. And so we had the Hell Attack base still in full operation here in Humboldt. And we were able to deploy that helicopter and resources directly to address that, that uh, ignition that we had in the Blue Lake area. Subsequently, the wind event started kicking off uh, ignitions in Redwood Valley as well in Santa Rosa and Sonoma counties. And that's where all resources were deployed or many resources were deployed. And so the good news is that had our wind event been later, there would have been limited resources here. So when we're in condition to burn, generally the rest of the state is in condition to burn. And there's a timing element that is associated with that. So we talk about average fire conditions, but then there's this, been this new kind of recognition that extreme fire conditions are becoming perhaps a bit more common. And so within that, you know, how do we address the relative type of exposures that each of us may experience or our, our properties may experience? We'll talk about direct flame contact, contact, invert exposure, and radiant heat. I think we've learned a lot about embers. I think embers are becoming more common in our vocabulary. Here's an image from uh, the campfire in paradise and you know, all those bright spots are something called fire brands and they are either bits of burning vegetation, maybe a pine cone or a, a, you know, some element of a tree or some element of a, of a bush but they can also be construction related, related to the buildings that may have engaged in fire. And so, you know, bits of burning material get moved in the air columns and they're kind of insidious. They're capable of finding all the nooks and crannies uh, in, our, in our structures and they're able to either penetrate them or create spot fires adjacent to them. And, you know, our conversation around wildfire preparedness really in the last several years has focused now on embers. And that's really appropriate because when we have wind events, we generally have embers and that uh, is presenting new challenges for us in our defensible space strategies. So if you look at this photo, which is taken from the Angora fire in South Lake Tahoe, you know, this was not a fire where all homes were burned based on 
uh, vegetation being ignited and flames being brought to the house through something which we might call direct con contact. But in this case, it almost looks like an alien came down and you know zapped that building because the vegetation is just fine. Or maybe it was an interior home fire, you know, from some other some other source within the home. In reality, what was likely occurring is that there was an ember transport, a long distance transport of some kind of uh, burning element that either created a spot fire on the building or near the building, or was able to penetrate some element of the house. Maybe a window was left open or a um, vent was um, permeable in some way. And so how do we as community members think about these types of potential exposures and try and create a hardened home one that is most robust to these types of exposures. So that's what I'm here to talk to you about. And, and to suggest that defensible space is totally appropriate. And, and, and the way we thought about it from a fuel mitigation perspective is completely uh, right on. But there's some additional fine tuning that we might want to do and we might want to think about. So Ember defense, you know, this idea that you have a long distance transport that perhaps may bypass our typical defense strategies requires a different approach. So here you can see that you know, some cartoonized embers are being bombarded at this building and do they enter the vent? Uh, do they you know, create a spot fire adjacent to the building? You know, what should happen? So as I summarize in this point, what I want you all to think about are some new vocabulary terms. And the, you know, the vocabulary is less important. It's more about the potential issues that your building or your community or your escape route may experience. Most of our work has been focused on this concept of direct plane contact where we may have an ignition somewhere else and we may have a fire burning towards our structure. The August fire was probably our most recent example of that you know, where we had a big run uh, coming in during the day and night, and the question was how far would that run go? And it moved you know, many, many, many miles in, in one day. So what's, what can we modify in front of that fire so that we either may be able to stage a cruise here, or we may be able to place where the fire just doesn't have the continuity to burn directly to the structure. This piece is critically important. The additional pieces that we need to think about are these elements of embers, where you have a long distance transport of burning firebrands that can create ignitions in the gutters, penetrate the vents, create spot fires in the buildings. And then this third component associated with radiant heat. Radiant heat means that you have an ignition of, as shown in here, a shed or an outbuilding. Um, it could be a garage, it could also be your neighbor's building. It also could be a whole lot of flammable vegetation. And the heat transfer from that ignition is enough to cause a vulnerability in the structure itself. In this case, it's illustrated through a window pane breaking, and then you can create an opportunity for your embers or flames to be able to penetrate the building envelope. So for us as community members, like our job is to understand all these three types of exposures and then think about how together we can kind of manage and mitigate those both individually and collectively. What I'd like to do now is give some illustrations, some examples of some research, recent research projects that I've been involved in and give some context and some visualization about you know, what this means. Uh, my colleagues and I were involved, what the question was? My colleagues and I were involved in looking at um, Paradise, California, which is uh, had uh, over 18,000 structures lost. It was burned in a 12 hour burn period. And you know what was interesting from an intellectual perspective, not in a sociological perspective, is that many buildings have been built um, or there was a significant population that had been built after the adoption of some change in the California Building Code, which so you might want to mute a few people there if, if we're having some feedback issues. Thank you very much. So the California Building Code has been a, has been a, uh, a change since 2008 to deal with exterior building vulnerabilities and try and help new construction and remodels uh, address that vulnerability. 
so I was, and my colleagues were interested in trying to understand what that effect was in paradise where we have basically a living laboratory of a bunch of new buildings that were built to this new high standard. And they had a, a you know, a, a sort of very significant event and very significant exposure to the campfire, which lasted, you know, more or less for 12 hours during that continuous wind period. So what could we learn from that? And one of the big take homes was that radiant heat was a really important issue for the damaged homes, those that were damaged but did not, but, but survived. And, you know, when I start, I want to look at sort of this visual image here. And so, you know, I know we're not in a workshop setting, it's a little hard to have conversation, but, you know, what do you see when you look at this? You know, here are burned homes, these are the gray and you know, ash structures of burned homes. Um, and you know, one of the things that I see is that there's a lot of green trees. You know, it wasn't a crown fire, it wasn't a fire that you know burned through the canopies of these trees. Really, where you see the burned trees are in respect to the buildings themselves. Uh, and so, you know, this sort of reinforces the idea that our buildings are really some of the most vulnerable elements in the landscape really some of the most combustible elements in the landscape. And once you get ignition in those buildings, there's a relationship that happens to the surrounding structures. So there was a surface fire in paradise. There was also an ember generated spot fire in paradise. But in many respects, it was not a crown fire. Where we got damage to the trees was in relation to the damaged buildings. We looked specifically at the number of damaged homes. And what we saw was that 63% of them were related uh, the damage was related to radiant heat, either in window and exterior wall damage. And so you get this sense of this kind of community effect um, and that you know, we're kind of all in this together. So if your neighbor's condition is vulnerable, that may affect your condition if you're in close proximity from building to building. And here's kind of a further visual uh, analysis of that. And you can see where full blocks go down but if you can keep the integrity of a block, you can see that um, the vulnerability in some respects can be mitigated as shown in both the left and the right images. So I'm not gonna you know, share with you the totality of this analysis, but one of the questions we were after is, you know, did the proximity to nearby structures factor in the probability of survival? And so we looked at a whole lot of variables that I'm not going to describe in great detail tonight and did something called a statistical analysis associated with um, decision trees in which the computer computationally evaluates what are the most significant factors and on a score basis gives you sort of the threshold of change. And what we learned, and I'm really mostly going to talk about this, this top factor, is that uh, if you were less than 18 meters away, versus greater than 18 meters away, the survival probability changes significantly. So 18 meters is about 54 feet. And so if you were greater than 54 feet away from a damaged or destroyed structure, uh, the probability of survival increases substantially. So what this really illustrates is that we're kind of all in this together. Um, and we did not uh, anticipate, you know, as a, as a group of scientists that we would find such strong relationships um, but, you know, I think it sort of intuitively makes sense that, you know, when we're in shared space with each other, our vulnerabilities are important to each other. We also learned that the relationship with canopy cover, um, which provides you know, needles and leaves and other fine fuels that can help carry the fire is an important factor. Uh, and then there's some other relationships respective to your built, which I'm not going to go into great detail here. Tonight, but I just want to you know share that we're finding some strong statistical relationships um, with some of the spatial variables associated with wildfire. I also recently had the opportunity to go to the Boulder, Colorado, to look at the Marshall Fire that kicked off on December 30th. It had you know uh, off the chart winds. There were winds gusted at over 110 miles an hour, and the fire burned basically during the entire period during the wind event. Uh, and it was extinguished by a snow event on December 31st. This is an image of uh, Boulder, Colorado. It's not a forested environment. It's really a suburban community plopped in you know, the, the lee side of the Rocky Mountains. And you can see the fire burning through parts of this community. Um, 
And the questions that the team I was involved with was really, what's the relationship? Here's a suburban community. You know, why did these homes burn and why did this one not? You know, what was it about this that made it more vulnerable or less vulnerable than these communities over here? And we learned some interesting pieces in, and this is more anecdotally driven, less sort of empirically driven compared to paradise, was that basically firefighter response had a significant factor in survival, but fundamentally buildings did not survive on their own unless there was assist, assistance from either community members or firefighters. And even though it was a grassland system where you know, embers from a grass um, origin uh, don't have long distance transport and they don't have enough um, size to be able to carry uh, a burning condition able to ignite uh, another member very far. So, you know, a grassland ember goes out rather quickly, whereas something that comes from a little bit more size and from, you know, a forested condition will carry longer. But what we did see is that those grassland embers were able to create new spot fires in the grassland here. Uh, and from that, those grass fires were able to ignite things like fences. So if you can visualize the fence that was along here, and those fences often connected to homes. And so the fences were able to carry the fire directly to the home. Here's an example where you can look at different materials and how materials perform. So I'm giving you this because the majority of my talk is going to give you some synthesis, but I want to give you some evidence behind that synthesis so you can understand where, where we're coming from. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of different types of glass, for example. Um, in this case, this was late in the evening. The fire was moving in here about 8 o'clock. It was um, close to really the end of the wind period. And the firefighting team had decided to use this pathway as a natural barrier and take this as a stand to try and protect these new homes that had been built in 2000. So these are condos, and they already acknowledged that it was, it was impossible to hold the line, you know, so much farther uh, above this, this loft in these buildings. But I bring this forward because it's interesting to compare. Here's tempered, uh, tempered glass windows on the top versus in, um, Excuse me, tempered glass windows in the bottom versus annealed glass on the top. And so annealed glass has far less resistive properties to the heat exposure compared to tempered glass windows on the bottom. So what you see is failure on the top in these annealed glass windows versus strength on the tempered glass windows on the bottom. And so you can kind of see how one, one product may compare to another. And you know the kind of exposure all of these buildings here uh, produced, and you know I think it's an interesting point to see sort of the side by side comparison. You can also see how the the um, broken windows damage the vinyl lines in here, and it's just a nice illustration of the kind of exposure that you might likely experience, uh, and why you know if you're likely if your building or your community is likely to have exposure from you know, an adjacent um, element, maybe a maybe building or your own garage or separate substructure, why on that side it's worth the investment in that tempered glass window versus a real glass window. There's also some interesting pieces about kind of the conductance of fire. So here's another set of side-by-side -side comparisons between two different buildings. There ultimately was firefighter response on this building. That's why you still have standing structure. Uh, it is a stucco-based construction building built in the late 80s. Um, they used a lot of walls that were um, stucco-based, or the basic substructure is wood. Um, so you can see the wood um, posts underneath here. Uh, the fire was burning from this direction. It dropped embers on the backside here at the golf course. Uh, there was a backing fire that came through the golf course. We're two weeks out, remember it's snow, that's why there's snow here. Uh, and the backing fire basically ran in and encountered this stucco wall. At the base of it was a um, set of screening to keep animals from coming in and out or other elements, but it also collected uh, fine fuels such as leaves and other elements. And so the backing fire ran into the substructure of this stucco wall and created ignition in that accumulated material. That accumulated material essentially ignited this fence, which is maybe hard to see here, 
if there was a property line fence that separated this house from this house, so we're looking at it from the other direction now over here, and what happened is essentially the fire burned through the vendor board that was defining the, the uh, one property from the other as, and garden from another, and this uh, tall fence, the fence turned a right hand angle and attached to this stucco building, uh, but the ignition of the fence created enough heat and enough embers and enough flame to damage the substructure of or damage the under eave area, which is wood, the wood composite, and get into the under eave area. So these connection points are things that I want to illustrate. These are things that many of us do not think about this relationship between one, one structure to another and how those things correspond. So you can see you know, here's an element of the post and how the fire whipped its way and turned to the right hand corner and then got into the under eave area and then into the attic of this building. There are two other places that fire got into the same structure. Uh, to my surprise, I, I wasn't anticipating this. This is, you see a, a cement pathway around this building. You can see the rock um, mulch that is around this building. These are all things that are great. The wind was coming this way. It was highly windy that day. It was also garbage day. So a lot of garbage cans flew over. That's why this Coca-Cola box is here. Um, the wind was distributing embers as well as debris. The embers ignited this um, conifer, a decade of conifer, did not ignite the substructure, did not ignite the surface fields here, but there was enough dead material in this conifer um, that it created ignition and we had ignition of this tree and that tree led to a fire, which then pushed on the under eave area of this stucco building and got into the attic. So this building had two penetration points. We were talking about the fence earlier, we're now talking about the tree. It also had this point reflected to this bush here. I'm bringing this forward because there are pathways that I think are important to understand respect to this concept of home hardening and how the relationship between the landscaping and the vegetation and some of the, the decorative structures we put on the outside of our buildings can become you know, challenges, can become detriments, and sort of how to manage that. So I stole this from your flyer here at Scarberville, um, and I know Scarberville is sort of the subject of tonight's conversation. And so there's a couple of things to think about. Um, I think we're, you know, there's the, it, you know, there's an interior fire in one of our commercial buildings or one of our residences, and how do we manage that, you know, within a community? There's also the issue of, you know, an exterior fire surrounding the community and you know, flames and embers forcing you in. You know, on the outside of Scarborough or on one of our other you know, important communities in, in the Southern Humboldt region. And so our strategies are maybe similar, they may be perhaps different. Um, when it comes to you know, our firefighting resources, the first priority is about life. And I know some of you on this call work in that volunteer firefighter space and you know, I want to acknowledge and appreciate all of that. Um, you know, our second response is really about how do we protect property and you know, that is a challenge based on the available resources, the available capacity, and um, you know, the weather conditions. So once you have ignition in that you know, higher density uh, environment, then the challenges become more severe. And I guess what I'm trying to encourage you all to think about is what can we do as individuals to try and you know, harden our buildings so that in the case that there may not be sufficient resources to be able to protect our individual structure, how does our structure survive on its own? How do we create those safe evacuation routes? Where do we go? You know, how do we help ourselves so that we do not experience that the kind of loss that so many folks living in California have gone through? It's a big question, right? These are not easy issues and uh, what I'm going to talk about today is really an evolution in thinking. It's evolved in part by you know, a couple of the studies that I just showed you, but also by you know, the last 20 years of fire conditions. The last time we changed our defensible space code, this was a, as a photo that was put forward to what we thought should be done. And I'll share there's many things that are right. I mean, look at this beautifully maintained uh, grass area. We can see the 
trees are pruned, um, that means that you won't, if you have a surface fire, flame lengths are not going to be very high. There's not fuel ladders or capacity for you know, flames to you know, engage in the, in the overstory of these trees. There's a road that comes through that might separate it. You know, this is a great and safe place uh, to, attend, um, to defend the structure. That's under the eyes of having um, an average fire condition and having something that you can manage and mitigate in terms of flames coming towards the building. But it doesn't necessarily address that idea of we might have invert exposure and we might have some kind of radiant heat exposure. And so where I see the failings in that in that thinking of, or you know, the limitations in that thinking is look at all this woody vegetation that is right adjacent to this building. And so should you have dry conditions like we're in right now, and should you have ember transport, what happens when there's land in this, you know, these, these shrubs adjacent to this building? What kind of exposure does that building um, take on and what is it capable of withstanding? And you know, you can see this in how we thought about it respective to some of our, our standards related to how to manage this, look at this vegetation vegetative space adjacent to these buildings. So much has transpired. And what we're now talking about in California is really a three zone system. Uh, and the policy has been created. The regulation is in its development. And the idea is that it's not just about defensible space in the first, first 30 feet or 100 feet, but it's also really looking at what's immediately adjacent to the buildings. And I'm not saying it's about no vegetation, but it's about rethinking about the vulnerability that, that buildings experience and how to manage and mitigate that. And it may look a little different than, you know, we sort of cultured through Sunset Magazine and through that, you know, beautiful French country garden. Um, but, you know, I think it's our challenge to try and figure out fire mitigation, beauty, drought, you know, water management, pollinators, all these pieces. And I'm optimistic there's a way through it. So now we're talking in California about a three zone system and you're gonna see uh, enforcement start to come in the next couple of years respective to what we call now zone zero, which is looking at the combustibles immediately adjacent to the building. And then um, you know, how do we mitigate those pathways so that you don't have fire burning to the building and you don't have you know, the ignition through embers or if you lose this outbuilding here, that it doesn't put force on the um, digital structure. Nothing will change respective to some of the issues around fire and steep slopes. You know, for those of you who've had the opportunity to experience this, you know that you know, fire typically burns uphill and it preheats the conditions above it. And so uh, that's preheating the vegetation to make it more receptive. And that can also be preheating the building and, and its attachments um, to be more vulnerable. And so, you know, how do we basically shut off that process so that a building that's sitting above a steep slope can basically be able to manage that? Um, we talk about, you know, separation respective to slopes and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I think most of this is relatively intuitive, um, but, you know, the risk increases on slopes. Some of you on the call I know are gardeners and I'm gonna say some things that um, maybe you don't like, uh, but please know I come from, you know, from a gardening family and, that, and I, um, my heart's in the right place here. There really is no safe plant list. A lot of folks are interested in a, in a, in a plant that's safe and you know, Kathy Weber's on this call and if she and I both bought uh, a Lavender, um, she'd probably take immaculate care and clean it and water it and do all those things. So it would start out supple and lush and uh, Kathy would be able to maintain it in that condition. As you all know, I work too much and I might plant it and I might uh, abuse it and not give it sufficient water and not take care of it to the best of my abilities because I work too much, as I said, and that plant might become woody um, and wouldn't have the same condition that it did when I bought it. So how you evaluate a plant becomes highly complicated because a plant condition can change over time. It also can change based on who's managing it. So Kathy gets the gold star and I might not. So you know, really when we talk about plants, it's really about pruning, irrigation, cleanup, maintenance, 
it's all those things. So you know, think about a manzanita and how a manzanita changes through time. Think about a palm and how a palm changes through time. And so for us, really, it's about placement more than it's about plant type. Uh, a lot of folks want to you know, fall into the native and drought tolerant or the pollinator friendly. And those are great options, but they have to be maintained. Um, what I'm talking about has a lot of data behind it. Uh, so there's no silver bullet. Just because you bought the lavender doesn't mean that the lavender is going to be as trustworthy uh, when you bought it or it is to the end of its life cycle. So um, sorry if that was bad news to you all, but let's think about where you place that plant and how it may become fuel and what you know your care is respected to my care and how, how it creates or does not create vulnerabilities to destruction. So closing in on the home hardening elements, you know, one of the things we think about is really you know, the vulnerable locations in buildings. And there are inherent uh, weak points in buildings. And so here are some examples. So here's a roof to wall intersection where the roof has a class A rating, which is designed to uh, resist exposures, but the wall itself does not. You know, the roof to wall intersection creates a place for accumulation of vegetation. Um, vegetative debris, meaning you know, leaves, uh, branches, perhaps um, needles. And so, you know, if that ignites, the roof may well withstand that, but the wall may not. Think about rain gutters. We need rain gutters for many reasons. They help us prevent the rot on the side of the building because they keep the water from um, pouring onto the side of the building. But they're also collection points and they can uh, create a, you know, a collection point which can then be able to receive embers and if you get a uh, fire in the, in the gutters, the embers and that fire may be able to bypass the roof and go underneath the roof's edge. So fences, you know, we talked a little bit about that respect to the Marshall Fire, but fences, you know, create great neighbors, super important, a part of our privacy and our security, um, but they also, if they're attached to the buildings, create a wicking point where if you ignite a fence, it can bring fire directly to the structure. And then the bottom two photos are a little bit difficult to interpret, but they're taken from inside a building in two different vantage points. The green line is the horizon line, and this is done in the lab setting. Um, but the point being is that here's a gable end vent versus under E vents. This building is being bombarded with embers, and the little orange lines are basically those embers penetrating the vents coming inside the building. So they're bypassing the vent and coming inside the building. And if there's something combustible uh, stored inside that attic, um, then those embers may be able to find a receptive what we call fuel bed and create ignition, and then the building may be able to burn from the inside out. So home hardening is about how to address these specific vulnerabilities and think about them and try and you know, manage them. So thanks to Kathy Weber, uh, we created some you know, really nice graphics to be able to describe some of these issues and sort of what the standards are and what the recommendations are. Um, the most important piece is the Class A roof, and we can talk about that in detail. Um, you know, some are standalone, some are assembly related. Metal roofing is an assembly related, and metal roofing is a standalone Class A. Uh, the edge of the roof needs a metal drip edge, which is the piece of flashing of which the gutters are attached to. Um, and we don't have a lot of research behind what works with respect to gutter guards, but the idea of keeping those combustible materials out of the gutters intuitively makes sense as long as the gutter guards are non combustible themselves, so meaningful metal. Box skin eaves make a difference. Decks, um, decks are lovely. I absolutely love decks. But uh, if you've got combustible materials on, around, or under them, it can create a great possibility for ignition. And then once you've got a deck ignited, it's be easy to bring fire to the building. We talked a little earlier about that roof to wall connection and this you know, potential collection point for leaves and uh, needles and other things. And so there's opportunity to create some more flashing points um, to you know, increase the robust quality of that wall. Uh, or make a one hour fire rating on that wall. Tonight, I'm gonna to leave you with some concepts around vents. And there are some new vent, new vent technology that are both ember and flame resistant, which makes a difference. You need vents so that you can create circulation points and get that hot moist air out and create cool air opportunities for that circulation flow. So you need two way exchange. 
but there's ways to make them a little more robust to set the fire. You know, keeping debris away from skylights, um, you know, I think that's relatively intuitive. Um, this gate attachment, the fence attachment, you know, if you've got a perpendicular attachment to the building, basically trying to create a way so you can break up you know, the potential for fire to lift directly into the building. And then respective to windows, when you've got structures that are close to each other where you could create ignition, thinking about how to upgrade these windows so that they're tempered glass or have some kind of metal shutter that you can deploy um, so that they're more robust to that type of fire explosion. How do you prioritize all of this? Um, you know, it's not meant to be complicated, um, but every situation is a little different. And you know, when your buildings are far apart from each other, here's the top priority, the roof and the edge, the vents, and then the vegetation and the defensible space. All these pieces stand above the rest. Uh, when you get closer neighborhoods or you get closer buildings, then the decks, windows, and siding become you know, additionally important because you may have you know, radiant heat, uh, you may have um, some kind of direct plane contact from one building to the other. There's also this issue of respective of, deep, of steep slopes where you can get fire burning uphill towards your structure. I have a few slides set up to describe these things. I know I've been talking for a while. Um, I'm going to move through these relatively quickly, but just to say that you know the fire rating inspected to the roof, which is the number one priority, really deals with the roof itself. It doesn't deal with the roof edge, the skylights, these penetration doesn't deal with the vents. Um, so thinking about the roof as a system is important. We saw some examples about you know, accumulation and weak areas, so being aware and um, persistent to try and manage these areas is important. Um, a less complex roof is easier to deal with than a more complex roof. Um, tile and other products have gaps, and so these gaps create vulnerable locations where embers can, can penetrate, as well as debris, which can you know, be capable of carrying a fire. Gutters, relatively intuitive. You know, keeping gutters clean is critically important, and gutters themselves are critically important in a wind-based climate. Embers, we, we have a, a, a sense of respective to vents and how those, those play. Um, most of our vents out there are quarter-inch in screen, um, which is sufficient to pass an ember of significant size for green ignition on the inside. So we're recommending that vents be upgraded to eight inch mesh screening. There are additionally some vents that um, not only do that, you know, have an upgraded screening, but they also have the ability to resist flame. Um, if you manage the mirror to building vegetation, then flame becomes less an issue. Uh, but there are some new technologies in this space. This one has an aluminum foil and incandescent paint on top of it. When flame comes nearby to it, it seals up, it heats and melts. Um, this one has a tortured path, so it takes a while for anything to penetrate it. It works really well. This one has a steel mesh, which is a through roof vent. Um, so there's some new technologies out there to help in this space. You know, thinking about eaves and the under eave area, uh, once you get ignition right next to the building, you get um, an eddy effect, you get wind currents, and you get uh, more movement. And so when you have exposed rafter tails, and here's three block vents here, these round circles, there's more opportunity for uh, embers to get underneath the under eave area. This, this example probably wouldn't be an issue because the sidewalk is close to the building and the vegetation is far away. Uh, one way to mitigate that is to box in the eave and so you just you know, don't have that vulnerable location underneath. Windows, we talked a little bit about these perspectives to tempered and annealed glass. Um, what I really want you to think about is look at 335 degrees C for tempered glass versus 112 degrees C for annealed glass. Um, double pane, significantly greater than single pane, at least one being tempered glass, so you're likely to have a radiant heat exposure is critically important. I like to think about it as a tempered uh, pane on the outside, could be both panes. Lots of options here. Certainly, tempered glass is more expensive than annealed glass, 
but where you have buildings that are close to each other and the potential for radiant heat. This is a, this is a, a, a realistic management strategy. Here's an example of a single pane, uh, the first pane breakage um, from a ignition in a pot. Um, so you can get a sense that just regular two annealed glass pane windows, one is vulnerable. Um, this worked to its service potential, right? We didn't get penetration into the building, but we at least you know, show you here that you see that window pane breakage is, is common. Decks. I'm just gonna highlight there's a lot in the deck space. There's some, a bunch of new guidance around decks. If you are in the place where you're about to upgrade or improve your deck, reach out to me. There's some great guidance about how to redesign the deck, not expensive things that can make a significant difference so that if you do get ignition in some element of the deck that it doesn't uh, move directly to the structure itself. But when you're thinking about decks, what do we do? We tend to store our crap underneath them, out of sight, out of mind, uh, and it's relatively easy to ignite stored material under a deck. Um, and once the deck ignites, it's really hard to protect the building. Fences, we talked, you know, this idea about how you wick, uh, how fire can wick directly the building. So we're trying to break that, that continuity of the building by doing something different there. Um, you know, here's an example of a, of a metal gate that you still have a wooden fence that separates the properties, but that attachment point has moved to metal um, and is not combustible. Uh, someone sent a picture of this uh, example of, a, of, you know, here's some metal roofing that's being used to, to sort of simulate that same example. And, you know, that's totally right on. That's exactly the point that we're, we're trying to illustrate here. The average person that I talk to tells me the first thing they want to do is replace their siding, and that siding is the fundamental issue that they want to work on. Um, respective to these fire issues, siding for me is the lowest on the list. And I think here's um, some examples why. Here's a stucco building, totally non combustible, uh, but you can see we still had full addition of the contents. The vulnerability point is generally not with the siding. The vulnerability point is with the windows, with the roof, with the um, um, vents, with some other element, and then you get fire ignition on the inside. Um, I'm not gonna say that, the, you know, that you don't wanna replace your siding, but think about the other issues first. There's also an important issue respective to um, if you get ignition near to the building, you know, what's the, what's the contact uh, between uh, the garden beds and the building? And, you know, where you've got basically no transition, you've got substantially more vulnerability than where you have um, you know, some kind of vertical uh, zone. Here's a perimeter foundation and sidewalk. Um, so these two things, right, it's, it would be relatively hard to create enough ignition in this little debris that's collected here to create uh, penetration onto the siding as compared to this example over here. And there are, you know, many other vulnerable locations. You know, here's our cute little Fido here. Think about the evacuation point and what happens when you've got these penetrations like the dog and cat door or the um, skylight. Um, you know, these are other points where, you know, upon evacuation, hopefully you can shut those locations, you can close the windows, um, and you can sort of manage that. The under uh, garage area, there's often kind of a sloppy joint where the garage door comes down and it doesn't seal tightly there. You know, so these are things to pay attention to. And kind of what we store on the outside of our buildings are, you know, additional issues. Um, these are simulated examples, but you know, I keep a broom on the front porch of my cabin, which I use to sweep off the, the deck. Um, and I recognize that, that broom has its own vulnerabilities. So during you know, our fire season, I keep that broom inside the house or inside the cabin so that it's not vulnerable. Um, you know, just kind of being aware about these collection points where embers may accumulate. Uh, during the August fire, you know, my cabin's in Paris, that's where I grew up, and um, what I learned was that my under uh, front door area had too big of a gap. There was about four feet of ash that had blown underneath my front door uh, onto my wood floor. Um, fortunately, it was all cool, 
Um, but I had a vulnerable location right at my front door. During the fire season, I now walk away and I put some metal tape over that um, to try and seal that off because you know I'm not there and that building needs to survive on its own. Uh, and I know that that's a weak point in that particular building. All right. And now I'm going to talk about something that is probably near and dear to many of your hearts. Um, and then we'll share some things that maybe are not popular. Uh, there are um, passive systems and there are active systems. Um, I'm wrapping up here, so you know, if you're getting tired, I'm wrapping up. Um, most people want some type of active system, meaning they want to spray something upon evacuation or they want to turn on a sprinkler system uh, to, to provide additional protection. And you know, for me, as someone who works in this space, you know, I think what I've seen is that often you don't get much warning. Maybe you never got to go home. Um, maybe the fire ignites at night and all you can do is just get out of harm's way. And so if you're reliant upon some kind of gel or coating or a sprinkler system, you might not be able to trigger it. And so what I'm gonna encourage you all to do is think about systems and ways in which the building is protected on its own, on its own merits and doesn't require you, doesn't require time, doesn't require additional efforts. The gels and coatings, they're great. Uh, if you do them thoroughly, if they're within their period of performance, but often you see that evacuation is required maybe three days in advance, uh, of which they move out of their period of performance and start to lose their effectiveness. And in the exterior sprinkler system, you context, you know, how much water do you have? Are you pulling off the central water system? Are you taking water away from, from firefighters who may need it? You have wind behind the event, and it takes it hard to get water to go where you need it. Um, you know, these are complex things that are hard to fully engineer. And you know, I'm fine if they're the last uh, element in the list, but as the first element, I would say take care of your basic stuff first because there's too many um, potential failure points respective to the coding to make serious concerns to save you. Okay, you can hit me all for that. And as I wrap up here, I just want to say. I think the good news is that there's reason for hope. We have a good sense of sort of the predictable nature of the vulnerabilities and how we manage those. And from a philosophical perspective, when we think about earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes, well, we adapt and we build smarter. We don't just build a, you know, a force. We don't have a fire, we don't have an earthquake force. We don't have, you know, we don't try to fight those. Uh, we figure out how to manage those. And I think we need to come to that same realization point respected to fire. Fire will always be a component of our landscape. And uh, it will be an exciting point you know, when we get to the point where we're like, oh, there's a fire over there, no big deal, I'm not worried about it. Um, and I'm optimistic that we can get to that more resilient future. Let me conclude by saying, you know, the majority of homes are ignited for members. They tend to be wind-driven events. Um, we have a great volunteer fire department that manages the majority of our average fire conditions, but when we hit the extreme events, that's when things get more complicated. Um, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, hope respective to the construction codes, respective to, you know, thinking more about these ember and radiant heat issues and how we can manage those. And, and the new defensible space standards that are going to come in is illustrated here where we start to recognize how do we protect the exterior component of our building. So, you know, I'll conclude by saying there are examples of hope. There's a, a building in paradise. There wasn't a home within uh, you know, a mile in any direction that survived, but this one, there were things that were right about that, new vents, um, a tall perimeter foundation, lots of non-combustible uh, elements incorporated on the outside, a class A fire rated roof, this building took it a huge ember wash, had a lot of radiant heat, but it made it. Um, Kathy has done a really great job helping us put together some materials perspective to how to prepare your home. Um, these are available through the Humboldt County Fire State Council, and we can talk about them in more detail about you know, all the specific elements and what to do in those locations. You know, and I'll conclude with a couple photos here around what do we do? You know, what's right, what's what could be done differently respective to this building. Uh, it's a you know a gorgeous, beautiful wood-sided building. Um, you know what is the what is the fire season these days? This building is in Santa Cruz County, and I don't know that they ever went out of the fire season this year. So this element of stored materials, of which there's a lot, 
Um, you know, firewood is worth want to be close to the home during the rainy season, but you move it away during the non-rainy season. Um, I think there's you know some elements that could be upgraded here. We worry a little bit about this uh, roof to wall connection here and how to maintain that. Um, but you know, there's a lot of things that are great about this structure. A lot of um, elements, you know, which you're not going to have direct flame contact. But there's a couple opportunities for improvement. What about here? Um, you know, we all need places to store our firewood and our you know additional um, building products and other elements. Um, but you can imagine that embers could easily lodge in here and create ignition, and then you've got you know, a lot of materials to ignite respective to this building. So, what could you do here? You know, my thought is, well, why don't we box this in and you know make it more of a you know impermeable structure so that it's protected and not so porous. I think you want to make sure that we manage this line here where uh, you've got the corrugated metal roofing and you've got a potential gap. Um, there needs to be air circulation. I'm not going to ignore that point, uh, but you know, we can sort of manage this if we manage the exterior of it. Here's a home that was shared with me via the, the option to submit photos. And I don't know if any of you are on the call who can. Um, who you know, this is your home. Um, and, you know, certainly a little bit of paradise, a beautiful view, uh, you know, but what do I see? I see roof to wall intersections. I see places for accumulation. I look at the vent right here. Um, that's a concern to me. I look at this, you know, leaf litter accumulation adjacent to the siding. Um, we already see some, some damage potentially in the siding here. Damage means that it's easier to ignite um, because you already have more air uh, engagement um, in the edge here. I'd want to pull that back, try and, try and reduce the potential there. Uh, I might want to figure out a different venting system here. Uh, I'd want to manage this, this section here. I can't quite tell what's going on in the roof. Um, a lot of grassland around it, so that's great because that's something that's pretty easy to cut and, and cut back. What's stored underneath the deck? Um, you know, what's happening over in this direction. These are all elements to consider. And, you know, you don't have to take it all in one year, uh, but create a pathway, create a step-by-step -step, um, option for, for how to work through this. And you know, I'll conclude by one of the questions here. Um, there's a lot of resources. There's a lot of resources out there in the home hardening side. Um, we have a bunch on our website. There's also disaster safety, which is through the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. There's the National Fire Protection Association. Um, fire Safe Mendocino, as you all highlighted, had a lot of resources. Um, fire Safe Marin has really got a, a lot of resources. Um, so there's a lot to think about, and there's, um, I'm happy to help people work through those issues. So with that, I'll stop talking. Um, there, I see a few questions in the, in the chat here. And let me just say, update where fires are, when to evacuate, how to prepare. Um, that's a great question. So let me stop sharing and bring you all into the conversation. Um, here's what, you, you know, you're very fortunate that Kema does a great job. The red-headed black belt does a great job. Um, but there's also some additional mapping resources. If you search University of California and fire, you'll hit our fire map. Um, we, we point forward a fire map that's updated uh, four to five times a day. It's not our own map. We're, we're grabbing from somewhere else. And you can see fire perimeters. You can see hot spots and get a pretty good handle on what's happening. Um, to the best of everyone else's abilities. And so that's a nice resource. Um, and I, you know, I think the news does a great job trying to trying to give us the best available resource. We could talk about what to do in the evacuation space and how to, you know, how much time you have and what choices you might make. But I'll wrap up and turn it over to you all for questions. And thank you for being a kind audience. Thank you, Mitchell. All right, thank you, Yana. Great presentation. Um, all right, uh, 
Who wants to just unmute and ask a question or go ahead and raise your hand or type it in the chat? Yeah, Alex. Hey, I, I, I might have said this to you at the last time I heard you speak with um, Friends of the Lost Coast, I think, but I just want to say I thought it was super cool that you acknowledge your own history with fire and that like your part of your inspiration for getting into it was your dad having had a weed whacker start a fire. I just think that's so cool because I know that there's so much paranoia about acknowledging you've ever had a hand in anything like that. I just thought that was a really cool way to kind of, I don't know, just it's a heartfelt way to explain your interest in it and really honest of you and your presentations are amazing. I don't have any specific question. I just wanted to give you a compliment there. Thanks. That was probably one of my worst moments ever. You know, you're the only kid home. You're 13 years old or whatever the hell I was. And you're left alone and you get an ignition and I'm supposed to run the pump. And I couldn't, I couldn't start the pump. It's hard. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Roby? Yeah. Hi, Ayana. Thank you for everything. Um, so could you clarify uh, when you're on when your house is up on a hill, mm -hmm. uh, and where well, the hill is below you coming up, and I couldn't figure out exactly what the best distance between the trees below your house should be. Mm -hmm. It said it said um, forty percent slope six times, but I didn't know what the actual amount was. If I can get there, I'm, I'm trying to help you think about that. So respective to, so things are changing in the- Yeah, in, there you in go. The, in the California guides. Um, and what I wanna say is that nothing is changing in respect to this. So we, we think about vegetation height and separation as a product of slope. So, you know, here's, you know, here's a shrub of some kind, make it look like a manzanita. Um, so if the shrub is two feet tall, then the theoretical separation to, so if you had flame here, right, oh. how would it bend over? Oops. Um, okay. How would it bend over, right? It might bend over two times the height. Um, so if you get ignition here, how do you prevent the continuity to the next grouping? Okay. Right, that's what this is about. So okay. once you get more slope, right, you get more potential for that bending to change and wind behind it. And so this is all the standard stuff we've always talked about and will be in all the Cal Fire, uh, Ready for Wildfire materials. Um, but what I wanna share, I think what's, what's more interesting to me in this space is that, you know, as, you're, as you've got a house over a slope, I mean, the idea is, you know, fire generally tends to burn up here, you get ignition downhill and you get preheating as you go. Um, and at the top of the slope is the home, which has the amazing, gorgeous view. And, you know, what do you do about that? Um, and so some folks start talking about deflection walls and other opportunities to try and manage that. And it, you know, it really only works um, when you've got short, short vegetation, right? If you have shrubs and grass, you could put some of these kind of retaining walls here because the flame heights aren't gonna be great. But when you have trees, of significant height, you're not gonna build a wall um, enough to be able to, to manage that. And so the separation requirements or the separation guidance increases because um, the height increases. So the point being is that when you're on a slope, the more you can mitigate uh, the total vegetation quantity and its continuity, so one clump to another um, and its height matters um, if you're going to be able to maintain the, you know, the home above it. If you're building new, back that home off, you know, put that home here, not on the edge, just back it off a little bit. Um, because it's far less that you could to deal with. Does that make sense, Ruby? Yes, thank you. I, and if you're, if you're, have trees around you, like large oaks, mm -hmm. what do you think would, would you use that same equation for their distance, their height away from your home? That's a good question. I mean, uh, if you've got 
green vegetation and you've got green oak leaves, the canopy itself is not that receptive to embers. If you've got dry and damaged and dead you know, leaves, that's something different. Yeah. So uh, hardwoods generally do a little better than conifers overall. We're going into a you know, crazy drought, so it's a little, things might be a little bit off the charts this year. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of issues respective to houses are about some of the material that's locked so yeah. and the other you know, elements. And then when you have a wind event, more of that stuff comes down than during other times of the year. So a little separation helps. Um, but we certainly want the values of shade and we want the aesthetic values. So I think there's a sweet spot in all of that, um, but it, there's just more commitment to managing that, that you know. Thank you. The message, so please. Um, I think there was a question um, about the boulder fire where the you were showing the house that had the, the fence burning up to the house and there was a question about what was the proximity of the other house that survived and what were the, the factors for mitigating that radiant heat? Was there firefighters there? So what we saw sadly in, in Boulder is that no house survived on its own. You know, once we had ignition, the only thing that really made a difference was firefighter response. And uh, so the challenge is how do you prevent the ignition in, this, in the front end? I have a couple of small examples of where we saw um, a difference, but in pretty much every example, there was some element of either professional or neighborhood response that made, made a difference. The codes in, in Colorado are really different than California, um, far, far less focused around the fire element. Um, so it's not totally a surprise. It's, they don't have something equivalent to our chapter 7a, which I you know, referenced ever so briefly. Um, but it, you know, it shows that we basically are largely dependent on firefighter response, uh, unless we start to look at the specific vulnerabilities and try and make, make you know, management actions that can change that. Which I'm optimistic we can. These are not overly expensive things. It's just more being able to recognize what the vulnerability you know, is in our particular building and how to, how to address that. And my vulnerability in my cabin is different than Roby's building, which is different than Mitchell's building, which is different from Carl's building. So, you know, understanding that is, I can't give you a formula necessarily. But they're all a little bit different. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Gail? Actually, it's Bill. Um, Yana, you, you've been giving these lectures for, for a while now. Um, I, I hope you aren't getting tired. Uh, uh, my, my question here is like, like this, this audience right here is, is um, pretty high percentage of us. Um, and do you, do you run into that a lot? Um, and, and, and what, what, Recommendations do you have for for uh, in, in increasing the effectiveness of of um, landowners really paying attention to all of this stuff? And it was a really good presentation, by the way. I'd I'd like to add just just one little one little thing that I've observed from from doing the um, landowner reimbursement program that we're involved with, Flash. It, it is that that in some cases, and, and I've got one that I'm going to look at tomorrow. Uh, uh, it, 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 if you're there specifically looking at a house, and the landowner is there, and you're pointing pointing out problems, I, I think the chances are higher that they'll actually do something. Uh, I I did have one who when I talked to him on the phone said, oh, I did all these things, and I was, I was impressed. Um, but, but, but what do you see about uh, being more effective? Well, I'll tell you, my calendar is full right now. Um, I'm speaking uh, not only in California, I'm speaking in other places um, around the Western US. So uh, 
the popularity of talking about these issues has increased significantly. It's hard to know exactly how many people adopt these issues um, mm -hmm. or adopt changes respective to these issues, but it's not so hard to pull together an audience. And um, my typical audience level is 50 to 250 people for most talks that I get these days. Um, so that's encouraging. Um, it's hard to follow the populations to know exactly where the change piece comes in. But I think we all come to this at some point of personal concern. And you know what that triggering event is, it's hard to know. Um, you know, my triggering event might be different than your triggering event. And you know, the August fire was a pretty good reality check for me to see that I had all that ash burned underneath, you know, that or you know, lofted underneath my cabin front door. Um, so that was a good wake up for me. It's like, hmm, I thought I was good, but no, I really don't have it all together. Um, I think the interesting point to me is that we're changing the defensible space code in California and we're going to start to see Cal Fire uh, giving strong recommendations and then moving to enforcement in the next you know, one to three years. So that's going to change the conversation point uh, when suddenly people are going to move from compliance to out of compliance as we move in zone zero. Not that I love the enforcement stick, that's not where I want to start, but at least we'll have alignment among agencies. And we'll all be sharing the same messages with respect to that issue. Uh, you know, I think the, push, the real issue is that most people feel disempowered in this space. They feel like it's overwhelming. And, um, you know, most of our language is written about average fire conditions as opposed to extreme fire conditions. And um, this may be a little philosophizing, but, you know, to me, I think we need to be preparing, even though there's this incredible volunteer firefighting resource out there for a no response situation. What happens if no one comes? And what do we need to do to be prepared for that uh, situation? Maybe that's not the standard, but to me, that's sort of the aspirational goal that our buildings are capable of surviving on their own. And we've got a safe route for evacuation and not getting caught in harm's way. And I think we need to train people to know when, when to leave and when not to leave because it's too late and it's going to be too unsafe for them to get on the road. Um, I don't think this fire season is going to be a good one. I think this one we're going to see we're going to see more than we've seen in the past years. And you know, my crystal ball is it really optimistic? Uh, but that will create probably another point for reflection and conversation. Um, you know, we're in a difficult period of adjustment, and we're not out of this. We've invested as a state a whole lot of resources, but those resources are just coming to bear, and so I don't anticipate that conditions are going to change substantially for you know a decade or more. But I, you know, I get one of the media calls I get frequently is, "Why would you ever live in California? <laughs> why would you need to live in paradise? Are you basically crazy?" And I go, "Well, why would you live in tornado country? Are you kidding me? Why would you live in hurricane country? Because um, yeah. those are things you really don't know when to predict." At least for me, in the fire perspective, I think mean, a ton we can do to make a difference. Uh, I would be built in, in paradise in a heartbeat. Um, you know, knowing what I know and how to how to put those pieces together, I, I'm fully confident that we can build buildings and we can we can be confident in the space to make a difference. So, you know, it's about how to get that information out there and how to how to how to share that responsibility and that opportunity. So thank you, Bill, for all your work that you do with the FLASH program. It's, 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 it's making a difference. And, and all of the work that each of you are doing in, in you know, sharing these messages and, and trying to protect your communities, empower your communities. Um, at least to me, there's, there is hope. You know, all is not lost. You know, there's, there's lots of things that people can do that make, it, you know, make a difference. I just had one quick comment. Comment. Do you think that insurance will be another stick that basically some conjunction of Cal Fire doing inspections, and then if you don't end up being able to pass it, it seems like instead of them having to directly fine you, you may just lose some sort of certification that allows you to to, to get insurance. Well, the insurance space is a whole other conversation. Insurance is operating in its own space outside of Cal Fire and more people are losing insurance than, than gaining insurance. So that's 
that um, that trigger is happening independently, uh, independent of what CalFire you know, inspects on, independently of what we educate on. So uh, yeah, it, it's it's terrible when we lose insurance and think about what that does to you know all of us as homeowners, our ability to sell our properties. If you can't get you can't get insurance, you can't get a loan. You know, you, you have to have someone who has 100 percent cash options. Um, you know, it just basically fundamentally disrupts the entire you know market system around around you know, how we buy and sell property. So yeah, there's a lot of forces coming into play in this space that um, will increase people's motivation. There is a um, new effort that the insurance commissioner is launching to create some points for these kinds of mitigations that may keep some insurers in the game, um, may allow people to hold on to insurance, and may allow people to get insurance if they've done some of those mitigations. And um, that hasn't been deployed yet, but it's but it's coming soon, and it's kind of nested based on some of the things that I'm talking about here. Yeah, Roby, you had a question. Um, I had an, a, another um, question about when the when the siding uh, comes down to the deck. Do you think it's if I if if you could put metal between the two, is that going to uh, be a place for embers to catch on the top of the metal? Is that better than letting that little space between that be there? Oh. I mean, the better system would be to put the flashing underneath the, the siding, um, not exterior to the siding. Uh, so here, here's how, if, if you're building a new deck, you might do it. Um, so let me, no, just explain is... that. I mean, let me explain that system. And then I think then we can sort of back into when you have okay. a new deck. Because they're kind of interesting. So um, the idea now is that uh, you, you know, on your deck joist, you put a foil faced um, metal tape over the deck joists themselves. And it's not wrapping each individual deck joist to the ground, but like you have a joist and you put a cap in essence on that. And then you put the deck boards on top, but you increase the space to quarter inch spacing. And so there's two things that are happening. What, what's happening is that if you get ignition in that joist, it may not spread from deck from board to board to board. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the additional piece is that the gap um, has something to do with the physics of how um, ignition occurs. And you tend not to get as much smoldering and you tend not to get as much longevity in that ignition point there. So easy mitigation if you're building from scratch where you sort of manage the joist itself. So one of the things we've been talking about respective to retrofitting is perhaps replacing the deck board that attaches to the house with a non-combustible deck board. So mm -hmm. if you do get ignition, that it runs into a member that um, won't carry it directly to the house. Uh, and so what that might look like are some of those um, metal grates you see, and I, I've seen them most commonly like at a, a place where there's a lot of snow and you get um, stairs or you get a, a kickoff of the boots place right before you enter the house, which is permeable and is metal. Um, so it's like a metal grate system and they're similar in size to a deck board. Then you could replace the existing deck board with that metal, with that metal board um, that's permeable and basically break up that continuity. You could also increase the flashing potential between the house and the deck itself. Um, so that if you do get ignition that it, it may extinguish itself. Thank you. Uh, I know we're nerding out in the really details. Of I know. I, I won't ask any more because no, no, I'll just it's great. Out. I mean, it's great. This is, you know, my heart's in this space. So I, I just have one question. Uh, so, given the kind of close quarters of Garberville and how much response matters, what uh, what are things that people can do to help responders? I mean, Assuming you're asked to evacuate, let's say, what you know, what can you do that would help them? Uh, you know, what do they want to see? What do they not want to see if they were to respond to your house? I mean, Garberville is really—it's a very different place than the average rural community. It's 
I mean, I think the challenge for Garberville is how to prevent ignition from the start point and then to hope we have enough resources to be able to manage it. I mean, the good news is that there's a lot of people in Garberville, so it's going to take a higher priority than a place where there's less people. Um, we just see that that happen. We deploy more resources to where there's more people. And at least you have the Cal Fire Station and the Federal Volunteer Fire Department both there working hand by hand. You've also got multiple evacuation locations. Um, you know, so I don't want to speak for the, the fire professionals necessarily. I haven't had that conversation with them about you know points for aid. Um, but the you know the the basic contents are you know if you have enough time to evacuate to sort of manage the near building combustibles and try and pull those away, shut off the you know the barbecue and the propane tank and pull those inside. Uh, uh, um, close all the windows, you know, do things in that space. Um, leave a note about where you're out. Um, you know, leave some lights on. <coughs> um, these are sort of different things that you might do <coughs> in, a, in a rural environment where you're hoping there might be a first responder that, that comes by where you, you know, might leave a ladder up to the roof. You might need some buckets of water outside. You might need some fire tools so that you know, if you get an ignition, someone passing by can, can manage that. We saw that in Colorado. It happened a lot. There were a lot of community members <coughs> that um, did those pieces and, and you know, took on the responsibility to protect people's houses and, and it worked. Um, whether our fire team wants that to happen here, you know, evacuate early, don't evacuate late, and be smart in that space. That, that's you know, the biggest issue, you want to be out of harm's way so they can manage the issue on their own and not worry about your safety. All right, thank you. I was just going to say turnarounds, I know is a big one, like with fire departments, as long, if you're in a rural property, not in town, but as long as there's an ability to, to get equipment in and turn it around. And then they're basically doing triage is kind of a crude thing that I think is almost important to explain to the public. But if there's a severe fire, they're having to make determinations about which ones, if they put effort into, they think they could save. And if you haven't done some of this prep work prior and your house looks like it's just going to go up quick, then they have to make like a rough decision that, that it's not a worthwhile place to expend resources, basically. And that was shocking for me to hear, but it makes sense uh, if you think about it. I mean, their life is being put on, you know, their decision is about whether they're going to survive in that space or not. So, you know, make them want to be able to do that and be safe. That all makes sense. Yeah. Um, Dee Dee's asking, are there specific face masks that you would recommend to purchase to improve breathing and air quality when it gets really smoky? And 95s, baby. <laughs> We're all about in 95s, right? Absolutely. Yeah. We're all about face masks these days, right? <laughs> We're versed in that space. I don't mean to make light, but what can we do? <laughs> Funny thing we've all been through. Okay, any last questions? I think uh, John has given us plenty of your time. So uh, I just want to say thank you to Yana. You are the best. Thanks, Kathy. Teamwork. It's all about all of us figuring out how to lift this. And this is some of the Absolutely. Individually and collectively, you know, I guess what I just want to say is that I think we need to think about what that chart forward is and what the vision is of resiliency and adaptation. And we need to figure out what that is collectively and individually. And once we have a sense that that's possible, I think we can get there. So I'm optimistic about that. Right on. All right. Um, with the, Thank you, Yana. It was great. Thanks for all your work, you guys. Amazing. Um, with your permission, Yana, would it be okay to put this on the Fire Safe Council website for future okay. reference? Only if you pat yourselves on the back for all the great work you do. <laughs> Thank you, Yana. Thank you so much. This is great. Yeah, thanks for the presentation.
All right. Goodbye, everybody. Right. Good Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yana. Bye. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.